Welcome to another AP World History Lecture, and this time we're going to be dealing with international migrations in the late 1800s. So European imperialism had a massive effect on global migrations around the world, and this happened for many reasons. The traditional model for understanding migration is what is called push and pull factors. This means first what happened internally in countries that pushed people to leave their homeland, and second, what was happening in other parts of the world that pulled people to come to the recipient countries. That model is a great way to think about why people would leave their places of origins, and, and I want to make a big deal about that. We tend to think in our world of comfort and security, especially here in America, that everybody would want to come and leave here like us. But think about that for a minute. What would it take for you and your family to get up, abandon everything you know, and just move to a new place to take a risk? It takes a lot to get people to leave their culture, their neighbors, and their homeland. But there's another thing we need to think about when we assess this push and pull model. The model tends to leave out the relationship of power between the European imperialist countries and the natives that they were impacting. So here's my main thesis of this section. European imperialism created a global marketplace in which native peoples were often displaced and looked for new labor within the European empire. This meant a massive movement towards new rural and urban centers, and it meant a tension that happened between the migrants and the nativists in the countries that received them. So it's important to start off with the issue of power and how Europeans impacted local families and businesses. European imperialists tended to displace local businesses. How so? Well, for starters, European governments often placed restrictions on local businesses that forced them out of the market. For example, Britain placed high tariffs on Indian salt that ensured that local Indian salt manufacturers could not sell their salt in the British imperial market. Another problem that came out of European imperialism was simply the competition between small landowners and European large plantation owners and businesses. European plantation owners and businesses simply had more investment power and could mass produce more. This meant that they could make more profits and sell to larger scaled markets. This eventually put the small farmer out of business. So where did he go? Well, these workers looked for jobs throughout the empire that they belonged to. Indians looked for work in South Africa. Southeast Asians looked for work on plantations in India, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Italians looked for industrial work in Argentina. British engineers relocated to South Asia and Africa. Other nations also saw massive numbers of migrants, even if they were not conquered. Take China, for example. China was not conquered, but it was forcibly open to trade in the Opium Wars in the 1840s. By the 1890s, China faced a threat of a Western imperial power on its land, so they bargained with the US, Russia, Japan, Germany, Britain, and France for what was called the Open Door Policy. America's Secretary of State, John Hay, made an agreement with China that it would be separated into trade zones. Each European and American power traded with one of the Chinese trade zones. Now, on the surface, that probably sounds really good for China, right? Since China gets to trade with everybody, and each one of those powers only gets to trade with part of China. But remember, China sold few agricultural items, or what we call cash crops, on the international market. Probably the most important, if we remember from Chinese history, is rice, like champa rice. Whichever large landowner could do this would be able to buy up small farmers' lands. This led to small farmers either working on large plantations or going to the large Chinese cities. Now, that might not seem like that big of a deal, right? But Chinese population is so large, even a small percentage, let's say 5 or 7% of the people urbanizing, that's a lot of people. So what do you do if you don't have a lot of jobs in the cities? Well, the Chinese population looked abroad and they found jobs in California, in the United States building railroads. Now at that very same time, the Irish population had been coming to the east coast of the United States due to the growing poverty back in Ireland. And remember, a good deal of that poverty goes back to British imperialism, having taken over Ireland. And during the potato famine in Ireland back in the 1840s, not this time period, 1880s, the British really allowed the Irish to kind of just suffer under that system. A lot of Irish looked for some place to go to in order to find jobs and they went to the East Coast here in the United States, but there they faced discrimination. So many sought out jobs then on the West Coast. By the time they got here, most of the railroads had already been completed. So what was their response? Blame the Chinese immigrants. 
The Irish, under a man named Dennis Kearney, began attacking Chinese neighborhoods in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This got extremely violent. They actually burned houses, lynched Chinese people at night. All this led to a state and then national law that was called the Chinese Exclusion Act, excluding new Chinese immigrants from the United States. By the way, that act was not rescinded until almost 1964. Similarly, in Australia, the local white population passed a law called the White Australia Law that claimed that Australia was for people of Anglo-Saxon descent, not the local Aboriginal population. You might notice the irony in both cases. For the Irish, they had been discriminated against by the Anglo-Saxons in the United States. Australians from Britain, well, they were sent there as convicts. But in both cases, these groups blamed people different from themselves for corrupting their identity. Why? Well, first, in both cases, the fact that the Irish and the Australians were low in the American English hierarchy meant they had to retain their position against some group. Another possible reason is that the movement of so many people due to the relationships of trade, imperialism, and farming created fear that their identity and position was being lost. Okay, so what are our takeaways? Here are three big ones. Uh, number one, European imperialism created imbalances in power and economics that encouraged, if not forced, people to look for new economic opportunities. Number two, migrants sought out new jobs on plantations and factories around the world due to the crowding out of local business opportunities. And number three, this movement of migrants around the world oftentimes led to new types of nativism, racism, and what we would call social Darwinist arguments in which migrants were pitted against other groups of people seeking out resources and jobs. Okay, see you in class.